Okay, I've, I've unloaded enough on you. If you, <laughs> if you have any questions or this argue, if, if you think I'm wrong, I'm, I'm seriously open <laughs> to hearing. <laughs> To hear, yes. Well, could it be? Oh, there could there be a way of getting the best of both worlds into the best of both worlds, the liberal arts, as you were saying, that's for uh -huh. the um, people who have the time and the money to pursue art for yeah. enrichment yeah. and so on. Yeah. While the disciplines are for getting a job. Well, uh, and is there a way to combine it? <coughs> so because uh -huh. people do need to find oh, work oh, yes. and get a job. So, but we still want them to be able mm -hmm. to be civically engaged and um, enjoying life and appreciating yeah. why they're working. I mean, you're just yeah. not working. Some people are just working for the money and 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 the car and the house yeah. and whatever. But because they've gone through that value free. But is there uh, a way of combining? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. But I, I need to say I, had, I did not do a good job of distinguishing between edu uh, schooling that prepares you for jobs and schooling that prepares you for research. Uh, the great majority of people who go to college will not spend their lives doing research. No. Nevertheless, their college classes are oriented to preparing them to do research. So, uh, I mean, there are half a dozen, but it's especially three. The liberal arts would be one type, one direction. Job training is another, and there's a lot of just plain job training in community colleges and, and all of that. And then the idea is that the really prestigious and normative and ideal thing is to do research. And I think it's fine to have some places that prepare people to do research, but I don't think that's, I don't think most people need to be prepared to do research. So, no, no, there's no question but that we, a, um, the schooling system, again, of course, some people can be prepared to perform some jobs quite independently of schooling. There are still, most schooling doesn't, as it now exists, you could, you could have schools that are different, and I think you should, but, but most schooling as it now occurs doesn't particularly help a small farmer to do his job. Are there many small farmers? <laughs> if we take the world as a whole, yes. Oh, yes, okay. yes, yes. Yeah. No. But it's, it's not, I mean, there are other jobs. And one of the, um, one of the reasons I think there is going to be some serious reflection <laughs> more, more widely is that half, um, Half of the people who graduated from college last year took jobs that they could have taken just as well straight out of high school. Mm -hmm. But they have a large debt to pay. And I think, I think as more and more people understand that it's a smaller and smaller percentage of people whose economic situation is improved by going to college, and a larger percentage of the population whose economic situation is made worse by going to college, I suspect that attitudes toward going to college will change. I'm a retired seventh grade teacher, and I substitute still at the schools where I, in the district, mm -hmm. where I taught. And I noticed that there's so much emphasis on college when you go into each classroom, each teacher has selected their college to celebrate yes, and yes, say, yes. you can do it to all of their 12-year-olds. Right. You and, can do it, you can go to college yeah, yeah. to seven-year-olds. <laughs> to seven-year-olds. Yes. Yeah, we all have college either. flags outside our classrooms. Oh, are you a teacher? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, that's, that's, yeah. that's why I put an emphasis upon this value-free education at the college level tends to 
affect what is important to do all the way through and, and uh, makes a child-centered education much more difficult. Yeah. And we, we experience that every day, that it's not child-centered. Yeah. It's about something else. Yeah. But I was reading about um, Tagore from, um, you know, Indian... Yes, T-A-G-O-R-E. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Last night I was reading about him. Yes. I didn't know so many things about him, and my husband's named after him, so I thought oh. I should read Yes, about yes, him. yes. <laughs> <laughs> His mom was a big follower of Tagore. So um, he, he never went to college, uh -huh. but he's the founder of these great schools. Yes. And he's, he's considered a scholar with no college degrees. So your question about value three combining with value oriented, uh -huh. how do we make the combination? He touched on that. He said um, it's really combining the Eastern education system and Western education system. So one is not better than the other. So he said something like, Western education focuses on precise stuff, you know, like research, precision, um, those kinds of focuses, whereas Eastern um, systems focused on developing the human-centered approach, you know, this not religious, but spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, so we shouldn't let either one go. Yeah. We need both of them. So that what you said was reminding me of what I was reading. Well, the research gave us vaccines and cars and computers and so on. Yeah. But cloning, do we, I think I we think have to, yeah. I, we have to have some conversation about the ethics of some of what our medicine is allowing us to do now. So I think we have to. And, and all right, I would say there have been times when an education encouraged one to, to raise that question and actually help one think about it. And that's what I'm upset, that yeah. we spend so much money on pre preparing people and actually developing a negative attitude toward raising questions of whether you should I do things. I had a sign in my classroom that said, you may respectfully question authority. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> they can ask me, they yes. can, as long as it's respectful, but well, that, question, question, question. Yeah. Well, if, if they can question, if you create the climate where they can question authority, you are at least recognizing the value of their thinking for themselves. Right. And that's one very important value from my point of view. To what degree do you think it might be possible to restructure locally the way education operates and the way we're able to act with, if you will? Yeah. Well, um, we seem to be in a kind of a perfect place and a perfect time, you know, um, to maybe approach those conversations. Well, I'm I'm just now involved with a Chinese woman who lives here. Well, she lives in Ontario, but she's in Claremont much of the time. <clears throat> who's also part of the process movement that I'm a part of. And um, she is determined to create some education uh, of, a, of a sort that is appropriate from the point of view of our philosophy. Okay. And um, I think she, I, I, I'm quite sure she can do it in China. Whether it will catch on in the U.S. is another question. I think it has a chance. But I won't try to give a lot of detail. But in China especially, I think it's similar here, the whole educational system teach children to compete with each other. And I keep telling them you cannot build a socialist society on a capitalist education system. <laughs> And I, I think that, I mean, uh, what I'm most interested in, in the prospects of this would be to develop a group of, uh, get a group of 12 people, please, uh, the exact number is not what I mean, but I'll just il illustrate what, might, what you might do. Get a group of 12 people who would sign up for 
maybe three years of part-time study, because this is not preparing people for a job. <laughs> um, and um, a major part of that would be for the group of 12 with a proctor, advisor, whatever, but it has to have some really good leadership to um, s settle on a, a serious question in if, if these are Chinese facing China right now, okay? So something like, uh, we all know that simply increasing consumption is going is speeding up our share, our joint destruction. On the other hand, there are still in China maybe 10% of a population who are living miserably, really need more, okay. Is there a way in which without increasing our demands upon the environment, we can um, overcome demeaning poverty? I mean, I, I, I don't think everybody who is poor by our standards is miserable and all that, but nevertheless, there are, there's a type of poverty that no one is happy with, <laughs> everyone. Okay, well take a question like that. It is, it's discussed on the margins in China, but in serious discussion, no. Does any university face a deal with questions? I don't know a university that would take up a problem like that in China or the United States, but I regard it as a very important question. Well then if the group of 12 say, okay, now what, you know, they think about it together and then they say, well, this is a question that relates obviously to economics. It also relates to agriculture. It also relates to psychology and sociology and government and so forth. Um, one of them would say, I'll work on these issues, you work on this. But as a team, work together to produce an advance in thinking about a very serious issue. Now to me, that would be real education. And I actually believe, I mean, I said before, and I don't want to start out saying we're preparing people for jobs. Once you've done that, you're lost, <laughs> okay? You have to say, what job is this? My, my view is, if they succeed in publishing a document that gets some serious consideration by, at various levels of government in China and so forth, I guess they'll be picked, snapped up for jobs <laughs> too. But I, 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 if, if that's the side effect, then it's great. If you set out saying, what job is this preparing for? You'll, you'll never get that. But that, if, that way you would learn to work, you would learn that real advance comes from working together, not from working competitively. And you see, I, I think schools teach more by their structure and, their, and what, what they make the students do and the ambitions that are set before them than they do in the content of the class. So I'm trying to think of ways in which people get a very different message from there, from schooling. And I think that could be done in existing universities in this country. But the university as a whole would have to say, yeah, we'd like to have an experiment of that kind and uh, release the students from all standard requirements. In other words, it would be physically located on the university campus, but it would not be part of the regular academic program. Um, so I uh, had a couple of things. Thank you so much. This is really amazing. It's really great to hear you talking. Um, the one thing um, that I've just been struck by, I've just been working at Pomona College, mm -hmm. the Center for Collaborative Creativity. So ah. sort of the <laughs> This is an anomaly in there, but uh, yeah, no. There's, um, there's a there's a constant dialogue around debt and death. Debt. 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 Okay. Yes. 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 Debt. Uh, and um, yeah, so it's another kind of death <laughs> of uh, sure. our dreams. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> when you leave college, you have to repay those loans. Um, but uh, something that that I think about there is that you have this 
this kind of utopian experience potentially, you know, ideally when you're in when you're pursuing your liberal arts education and then you get out and your focus is making as much money as possible. So you're not really focused on the social good mm -hmm. or contributing to uh, you know, reducing the, the harms of the world because you have this huge burden that you're that you're is bearing down yes. upon you. Yes. And it's gotten worse over the years. Oh yes. Um, so I think that there's something that needs to be reconciled there if we're going to continue this liberal arts education system, uh, because it primarily exists within private institutions, which are getting more expensive by the year. So it's one thing I wanted to bring up. And then also another idea, um, another kind of question and idea is um, this, uh, the, the liberal arts education, as you're describing the history of that, kind of was, was created for the elite. Yes. And so my question is, do we really want to be replicating that anymore? Yeah, no, I, I did not mean to be just celebrating liberal arts <laughs> education. I, ce I celebrate a value-oriented education. Right. But yes. I really think the, uh, that if you just start, o start over and say, well, what are the things you most w need? We, we most want students to have for the sake of their own lives and their ability and willingness and interest in contributing to the salvation of the world, um, we wouldn't come out very close to that. The, the example I was giving, you see, the, the, the sorts of issues that I, uh, Joe was talking about, the fact that I was, 1970 was a, the high point of openness to radical experimentation in this country. And I wrote a book that year on is it too late? And I think it's now too late to avoid a vast amount of suffering. But it's not too late for everything. So we, we need, so but for uh, our universities to fundamentally ignore the fact that we are approaching the cliff, it seems to me shows what happens when you don't discuss values. I mean, almost everybody agrees it would be good for humanity to survive, but I think then it would be good for universities to organize themselves in a way that would promote that. Yeah, I guess my, my idea, I, I confess I'm an anthropologist, so mm -hmm. I kind of come from a, a different way of thinking about, like you mentioned. Um, oh, you know, anthropology has refused to become an academic discipline. <laughs> <laughs> anthropology and geography have been the, the main holdouts, and they have almost disappeared from American higher education as a result. So, yeah, I mean, it, it would, within anthropology, you're always learning about different ways of learning that happen across the yes, globe. Yes, 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 yes. Um, okay, let's have a University of Anthropology. I, <laughs> and let, let you be the president. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not exactly serious, but I'm half serious because I, I do think, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. I, I worked uh, and wrote a book with an economist who had been uh, excommunicated by the Guild of Economists. And uh, guilds, I mean, the academic disciplines are very tightly orthodox. And if you are a heretic, you don't have any chance. No, it's, it's they love to say the churches, but I, churches haven't excommunicated anybody for a long time, but I can give you a long <laughs> list of people <laughs> who've been excommunicated from, from the guilds. He questioned whether the whether growth should be the fundamental goal of the economy. Yeah. Growth is God. Oh yeah, no. And uh, uh, this was back in the '70s when the people were doing that, and quite a few students came to work with him, but his colleagues systematically flunked them, which made it a rather awkward situation. And there was one department in the university that invited him to come. It was geography. Oh. <laughs> but what was I, the name of your book? 
It's okay. called For the Common Good. Oh. Yeah. No, it's had, as my books go, it's, it's one of the few that has had some influence. The ec he's, the, he's considered the father of ecological economics. And although ecological, ec in 95% of universities, there is no ecological economics taught. There are some colleges and, and places, and there is an international society of ecological, you know, I mean, it exists, but it has not been, has not been accepted because it's not oriented to the increase of activity in the market, and that's the only thing that counts. If you worship any other god beside that, I can assure you, and I'm serious, you, you don't have a chance. I am not an admirer of what the academic disciplines have done to people. It's, we have 50 orthodoxies in every university, and you're not encouraged to ask questions about the, whatever is the god of that particular department. Yeah. How would you choose which values get to be in the ideology of a university if it's a public university? Okay. Well, from my point of view, the, the fac if the faculty got together as human beings, you know, now that may be impossible, but I just imagine, <laughs> imagine actually being human. And uh, you said, uh, what are the most important issues in the world today? I think that they could probably agree on some. And I think the survival of the human species is one most, most people could agree on. I think you could get enough agreement on that so you could organize your university around that. The universal values, universal values versus local, localized values. Uh, and, and it's fine to have debates about it. The fact that you organize your university around that doesn't mean you have to agree about everything. Mm -hmm. And some people may say the only way to um, save the world is for us all to become mystics. Somebody else would say, oh, no, technology will do it. That, let's debate it. But I don't think there's any, any reason to think that we don't have enough agreement about values. Question. So, I, having heard you speak and having you know looked at education and schooling myself, you might agree, disagree, or maybe like it will just go on the side. So, uh, but I think I feel that there was a time and a place where like a, not a perfect but a close enough blend between uh, these approaches that existed, and it was in the '60s through '80s in the Soviet Union. Uh huh. You know, that's the uh, the ideals that you talk about is what my father, for example, shared that was a product of the higher education of the time. And myself, who caught the very end of it in the 80s, uh, I feel that there was, you know, it was science mixed with values. Now, the values were ideologically established, but at least I felt that the, the, the you know, the discussion of those values uh -huh. was built in. And also the, the, you know, the question of humanity as far as, you know, like, uh, health and the knowledge and the morals was constantly. Uh -huh. Have you, like, did, did, in your studies, did, did you ever look at that? Or I, I, I have not uh, done the kind of study of what's going on in various countries. I understand right now that the Finns have a wonderful educational system. I, I don't know enough about it. <laughs> but, um, what, what has been impressive is that the Finns don't give any homework and have few hours in school, and yet the children excel in examinations. I don't have any difficulty understanding that because if you really create a context of interest, if you get children interested, they learn very fast. But if they're bored, resistant, they don't learn at all. <laughs> My, my philosopher is Alfred North Whitehead, and he wrote a book called The Aims of Education. 
and it's a very different from the kinds of things I'm talking about, of course, in those days that human beings were heading to self-destruction was not um, known. It, it might already have been true, but, but he was just talking about how learning takes place. And he says, we need to begin in the stage of romance. And if you don't get children interested, it, it ain't gonna work. But if they get really interested, then you can lead them into a stage of precision where they will really do some research, get interested in looking it up in Wikipedia and other, other places and getting the information straight. And then the third stage is the stage of generalization. Whatever you have learned, test and see whether it has application beyond the particular area in which you have picked it. But of course, all three are going on all, all the time. And, uh, I, but I'm just focusing in these comments on the stage of romance. I think what is the third stage? generalization, generalization. Yeah. Precisely so as not to get tunnel vision the way the academic disciplines do it. Because you, so many, there are deep truths of, that have very wide application and they can be initially encountered in many different places. Is that what makes geniuses? Because that's been my question also. Uh -huh. Because like um, <coughs> Disney Concert Hall, you know, by Frank Gehry, and if you look at his other architectures that he's created, and if you read about his life, how he made, came up with this mindset of how does he come up with these never before seen designs, uh -huh. is He's mixing science with the forms and shapes that he saw and experienced when uh -huh. he was a child, like a fish swimming or random pieces of wood, and he makes something out of it. And the art and the science together. So in my mind, I, I generalize that maybe that's what makes a genius. Uh -huh. uh, what do you think about that? Well, I, I think that that people who don't allow themselves to be put in the ruts that most schooling encourages have a chance of, of seeing connections and putting things together in a broader way, and we can call them geniuses. Yeah. But then every great philosophers like yourself that I'm hearing they're all really saying fundamentally the same thing. You know, even this whole stage stage of romance all the way to generalization. I hear the same process, just worded differently. Yes. Even our educator, in education, you know, the heroes like Dewey and... Yeah, oh yes, them, oh they're no. They're all saying the same yes. thing. But then why is it that our school... <laughs> is exactly. Why is there resistance and then what is... What is the underlying cause of that resistance as a system? Yeah. Whereas the teachers have learned one thing from the scholarly stuff that we read, but then we go in there and they say, no, you can't do that. You have to teach it this way. And there's the regulations and policies. And teach it the way to pass the test. Yes, and the policy yeah, yeah. Yeah. that yeah. comes in. So it's well, it, it, it's, I mean, as I say, in China, teaching to the test is just overwhelming and you can't do anything else. You've just got to get them to know all the facts that are going to be asked on the exam. I don't think things are quite that bad in this country, but teaching to the test is, is, is completely destructive with, with respect to creative. I'll, I'll tell you a very sad story because I was... I thought it was one. The Chinese government, um, oh, 20 years ago, was already unhappy with the fact that though they could produce technicians of the highest caliber and so forth, that uh, the, the Chinese PhDs were not impressive by their creativity, originality, thinking outside the box and so forth. And they, there was a Chinese woman, white-headed, 
philosopher who they invited to create a different curriculum. And she did, and it, one of the things I just have to tell people is when I asked how many pupils are involved in this experiment, it said 30 million. <laughs> That's an experiment in China. <laughs> but uh, after it had been going on for a couple of years, the parents protested because they were afraid they were not going to do well on the test. So they, this, this te testing mentality is one of the answers to your question. I think bureaucracy as such is another answer to your question. But if, if, you, if you get a group of people together who are really excited about doing something, great things can happen. But if you get people who are simply hired to do a particular job in a wider structure, they have to figure out how to do that job with the least trouble and the least uh, upsetting of their superiors. And so, I mean, it's just built into bureaucracy. And I don't know how to avoid bureaucracy, except I like to keep things small. <laughs> I'm involved in half a dozen organizations, and they're all tiny. But, and uh, none of them have any bureaucracy. <laughs> talk was, was awesome, and uh, the question I have for you is when you talk about like a, like a value-based education or yes. non-value-free, I'm wondering to what extent the American Culture Awards plays into that, into, into the absence of values in the university. Yeah. That would be question number one. And then question number two is <clears throat> if you try to create a valued educational system, how do you avoid being labeled as, you know, either on the left or on the right of the political? Well, I've, I've given you an example of what one university might decide to do. I don't think every university should have exactly the same goal. And I think it's perfectly all right if people develop universities for their goals, even if not everybody would accept it. But um, on the issues that are heatedly debated and controversial, of course, if, if you have um, people in the organizing group who simply don't believe there's really any danger, then they won't get, develop any passion about developing such. But I, I think enough, there are enough people who now recognize our world is in danger that you could have several universities built on that. And the fact that there were some other people who said, oh, they're mistaken there. That, that's okay. And if they think that the most important issues are, um, what should I say, personal sexual morality, and that they should have a universe everywhere, that, that, that to me is a, is, is a value stance. I think it's a pathetic one, but that doesn't mean I would try to keep people from organizing if, around that. So. I'd much rather have multiple universities with varying va values. I do think we have more agreement and the dismissal of value concerns because, oh, any value you have, somebody else won't have, is, is really childish. You can hardly make a statement about what's true that somebody won't disagree with. But that's no reason that we shouldn't emphasize trying to be as truthful as possible in our sciences, for example. But I, I think that, I just think we've been sold a bill of goods. It just, the problem is not solved. I mean, actually, of course, we do have value. The value is money. Mm. The American people are told they should worship money and the universities do so, okay. But if you really ask people, is that what they really want to do? 
uh, there, there are enough of us who don't that we could have some other universities that didn't worship money. So John, then from a pragmatic standpoint, yeah. how do you go then about structuring that kind of, or implementing that kind of idea and, and putting that into people's minds? Because that's kind of, you know, to bring it back to, to what we're trying to do yeah. in the middle tree. I mean, that sort of is it. And, and Eric, who just asked that question, he's our programs director and, and the head of our college counseling department. Yeah. And, and we're really big, actually, on saying, well, if college ain't for you, then here's some other options. And Good for you. And, 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 and so, so I, I guess from our standpoint, we, we're kind of wondering how we go about creating, at least in your words, you know, this sort of value-free, uh, value valued education, uh -huh. but, uh, but how do you implant that idea into other people's minds, again, in a pragmatic way, yeah. and, and how, I mean, if, if you were to build a, a, a valued university, I mean, how do, how do you structure that kind of thing, and how do you make that sort of, because again, this is what we're trying to do here, how do you make that a reality, right? Well, I, I mean, I don't think you can make, I mean, you as an individual, and you as an individual could get together with me in May, June, and we could talk, talk together about how to do the university that sh she's talking about creating, okay? But I mean, in terms of this institution, you, you are focused in a different way, but I think, I think whether you, how, however, well, to whatever extent you um, ex make it explicit, I don't know, but I think that you are doing student-centered education. That's correct. And that's a very different thing from exams. Of course, the students have to pass exams. And nevertheless, there's a difference between whether you're focused on the student. And, and if you focus enough on the student, then suppose, well, maybe this student is not going to pass exams. But that you, by having worked with you, they may feel, well, that's okay, I, I couldn't do that, but they, the, this is something else I can do, and it's not crushing. In, in Japan, where I grew up, um, the number of suicides of 12-year-old children who don't pass the exams is awful, because they haven't been helped to, <laughs> to know who they are and what their potentials are, they've just been told they got to pass that exam. And if they don't, they've disgraced the family and all that. I think you counter whatever pressures there are in that direction. And if you are, you know, advising some students, no, you don't have to go to college. If you go to college, you will owe a lot of money and you'll have a hard time ever paying it back and you very likely won't get about it. You know, I mean, being honest with kids is surely a, I, I've been, I, and I've got to say, I'm very proud of, of Eric and, and, and his team for how they have handled all it, because I've been yeah. in meetings recently with Eric where he has said almost verbatim yeah. exactly that. Okay. Saying, well, I've lost us money, but probably gained them, <laughs> you know, tens of thousands of, of dollars, right? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Maybe I'm not very good at my job. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I have the feeling that in, in terms of what you can do, and you can't change the system. You can humanize it for, for a fair number of students. And that's what and, we're really trying to do. We're trying and, to be a support to the system and then maybe kind of be this benevolent virus. That well, I, I, hope, I hope you're primarily a support to the individual students who come, and incidentally, that supports the system. <laughs> then, I, then I think that that's what you can do. But I also think that uh, we just need to help people to break out of the notion that what is is what obviously has to be. I mean, the present system is very different from the system 40 years ago, and it can change. And um, I, I have this I mean, if you say, how can it change? I, I, I don't, I'm not at all sure that I can do the least thing about it, but, but let's suppose we were able to do in this country what I said I think can be done in China and really have, really create examples of teams that have studied together and then worked together on how to distribute the work and then come back together and created something, 
I believe the quality of what they create would, could be made recognized. And if, uh, if people looked and said, well, look at what these people do. They don't get any degrees or don't pass any exams, but they actually contribute to thinking about important questions. And they, they build community and understand how we support each other. And just to have an example of something different that would be impressive might stimulate some very serious thinking about, about education. I don't, I, that's all I know to, to try, so that's what I'm trying, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so what I've been doing since the turn of the decade, 2001 or 2000, and I've been the only teacher I think in the district doing it. Um, and they've let me do it because the kids have done fine. Uh -huh. So they leave me alone. <laughs> that is the design thinking. And whatever you're saying is compatible with that. Yes. Even at a larger scale where you're saying, you know, the question about some problem of the world that you're looking at it from different angles, but you have that unifying question uh -huh. that unifies all the different good, good. areas. Okay. And so at primary level, it's the same thing. So instead of having the science book and the social studies and language arts and math, so I look at all that and I come up with a unifying question that's gonna unify what I'm supposed to teach for next six to eight weeks, and then combine, bring different subjects in that address that question. And you can, and you can get away with all of that. And you and have I, gotten away with it, okay? I, I think that's wonderful. I pretend I'm doing what they say, but I really am not. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh -huh. take it to me. <laughs> so, and, and they know, but they don't say anything. And Dr. <laughs> Seligman is next door to me, so she knows what I do. Uh -huh. So, um, but. Well, that's, that, that's wonderful. I would hesitate to recommend it because I would be afraid I'd just be getting people into trouble and getting, you know. But, uh, but if the inspiration <laughs> came from, the inspiration of saying no mm -hmm. to them came from, I met, I had the chance to meet Jerome Bruner. Oh, huh. And um, my question to him was, how do you know a good school when you walk into it? And the way he described it, and then I said, well, what if it's not, then what do you do? And he said, say no to it. And so it's my way of saying well, no to it. I um, congratulate in you. A, yeah. In a hiding sort of way, because yeah. I need my job. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that's what you were saying about the Chinese uh -huh. system that you wish to create. I think at primary level, I think I'm doing something. Yes. Similar. Oh, yes. No, no, it can be done at all levels. My, my only reason for starting on, at the advanced level is, is because, you know, at present, you're supposed to teach grammar school in order to get people in high school, you know, that whole model. So if you had another model in mind of where things would end up, it could begin to loosen up, though. Uh, you know, I, I'm not claiming I'm expecting to make a huge impact. <laughs> I hope you understand. But just as you're not transforming everything, but everybody can do something. <laughs> yes? So, yeah, part of the problem of value-free education would be that it trickles down to lower education. Yeah. But then I think you also touched on the other part of the problem is that when people go to these research institutions, they don't know how to apply what they learn. And, but they're supposed to have ethics classes for that. So what do you, what do you think the problem with the, those ethics classes are? Now, now are, are you talking about existing ethics classes? Yes. Mm -hmm. And where have, where have you encountered them? I, what? Oh, sorry, go ahead. In, yeah. in, yeah, a, yeah, in professional do. schools, you sometimes mm -hmm. get that. You have them in, in um, a lot of uh, research uh, uh, disciplines because if people are doing work with um, with people, mm -hmm. um, and of course, there's the internal review boards at mm -hmm. all institutions. Oh yes. Oh, to, oh know, okay. All right. Yes. Yes. But there's yes, also yes. ethics classes within. Uh, sometimes they don't get offered, but 
but they're usually listed in different departments. Uh -huh. um, and okay, it's, it's the ethics of particular academic disciplines that... It's the ethics of research. So the ethics of, eth of, doing, of research in general. Of doing research with uh -huh. people. How do you treat yes, people? Okay. How are you supposed to treat them with respect and, and protect their uh -huh. safety and all these things? Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's, I mean, after the prison experiment in, in mm -hmm. the basements of Stanford, that's when this all happened. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, I'm glad there's as, as much of that as you say. And I do not know enough about it to know whether it's primarily uh, teaching people a set of guidelines and principles that have been worked out of whether it includes helping them to do their own reflection about ethics. I'm taking a class right now, ethics okay. in leadership, and that's kind of what they're talking about. And, and also, like, how do you make ethical decisions? How do you recognize, if, from your perspective, what is ethics? You know, uh -huh. so okay, so you are, you are encouraged to ask fundamental questions. Absolutely. Very so good. Okay, well, I'm glad to hear it. I think we've probably talked out. <laughs> 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 <laughs>